thank you for having me he here. It's, it's my program, so I shouldn't thank anyone. Uh, uh, let's talk about questionnaires during the question and answer session because our own EMR has both of those. So uh, this, I don't know if it's culprit or, 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 or uh, benefit, but let's talk about the alpha cell because more than any time in the history of uh, medicine, and let me pay my tribute to Dr. Roger Unger, uh, who, who recently passed away and, and is such an inspiration for learning about the alpha cell. No disclosures. So remember, these are the pancreatic cells, the alpha, the beta, the delta, the epsilon, and the pancreatic polypeptide-producing cells. Uh, we know very little, we know very little about the beta cells. We know even, little, even more little about the uh, uh, glucagon-producing alpha cells. We know absolutely nothing about the delta cell. We hardly know anything about ghrelin and certainly nothing about pancreatic polypeptide. And more importantly, we know we've just started understanding how they connect with each other. So I just try to run through, run through some ideas, more like a Saranabhavan uh, Tiffin sampler of this whole thing. Uh, some of us got together and did a, a full issue in Journal of Diabetology and Glucagon, which I would recommend for people who are interested in it. I'll, I'll give you the thing. So remember in physiology, this is the basic stuff. You have, this is the relationship between uh, gluc the beta cell once there's decrease in glucose, there's decrease in insulin. The alpha cell, there's increase in glucagon. Similarly, increase in insulin, decrease in glucagon. In diabetes, there's no decrease in insulin, there's no increase in glucagon. There is no increase in insulin, and there's an increase in glucagon. That's really what's happening in, in, in diabetes. So this is what glucagon does, right? The pancreas uh, releases uh, uh, insulin. This goes to the liver. The pancreas has alpha cells. This also goes to the liver, and they counterbalance each other and get plasma glucose normal. When there's decreased glucose and there's hyperglycemia, the alpha cells increase glucagon. The glucagon simulates gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Plasma glucose remains normal. But what we know is that it does much more. This is its effect on gluco glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. It has effect on lipolysis ketogenesis. Importantly, it has effects on hepatic amino acid uptake because the hepatic amino acid uptake is what goes back and controls the alpha cells of the pancreas. It works on food in intake. It works on energy expenditure. We've all talked about diabetes, but here is Roger Unger's definition of diabetes. Not today, 1970. Please, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put the reference to this article. Just the classic of a man who breathed and lived one aspect of science and an amazing human being. Diabetes is caused by insulin deficiency, amount or effect, and glucagon presence or excess. And 50 years after he said that, we know this is true. This is his original article. It was published in 1970. What is glucagon? It's not one molecule. It, it, it is tissue specific. We know its presence in the pancreas, but the reason we can't measure glucagon, the reason that we, are, we don't know much about glucagon is it's ubiquitous. It's present in the intestine, it's present in the brain, it's present in many forms as oxyntomodulin, as glucagon related peptide, as GRP, as IP1, IP2. But what it does is it works at the heart, works at the brain where it increases glucagon production and satiety. Works in the kidney where it, excuse me, where it increases EGFR, where it works in the intestine where it decreases glut mobility, it works in the liver which is where it really does all its work, and of course it works in the pancreas. While we talk about most of its control, the major control of glucagon and insulin is not by anything else, it is by themselves. There is a paracrine control that occurs in the alpha cell, it occurs in the beta cell, and there are external factors like insulin that comes in, GABA, but the most important control of the, uh, of the beta cell is the alpha cell. I've just put, you, put this together to show you, and there's an old slide, but what it tells you is the relationship. That there are so many interactions occurring between the alpha cell and the beta cell that any understanding that we have of this disease is still very, very primordial. Right? I'll give you a very simple way of understanding this. On the top is insulin production, and the bottom is glucagon production. You take a mirror, can you see? 
glucagon production mirrors insulin production. When insulin goes up, glucagon goes on. When glucagon goes up, insulin goes on. That's, remember your home? Exactly. You compensate for each other. And what happens when a house becomes dysfunctional? Lack of, this is the reciprocal signaling in the alpha and the beta cells, but let's what happens in diabetes. This reciprocity is the first thing that is lost in diabetes. That relationship between the alpha and the beta cell that occurs, this, this husband compensating for wife, wife compensating for husband, exactly. Other poach in our family poach, exactly what happens. So this is the relationship between insulin and glucagon glycemia. So what really happens is, when in diabetes, it's not just insulin that there's a problem. There is a defective postprandial regulation of glucagon. So when you give a carbohydrate meal, this is what's happening in NGT. This is diabetes. Can you see what's happening? This is insulin, and this is glucagon. So we've been barking at insulin, but we really don't know that it's actually the both. An example, the lack of suppression of glucagon is really what causes postprandial hyperglycemia and diabetes. So there is reduction in glycogenolysis, there is uh, uh, plasma glucose. Now this is not the only bit, it's not just glucagon, there is a part about the glucagon receptor. The, you can't really modulate glucagon, why? It's made by the, if you, if you shut it off in the pancreas, it's made in the intestine. You shut it off in the intestine, it's made somewhere else. But, so the only way to modulate glucagon is to make work at its receptor. That's what GLP-1 receptors and others do, right? So when you make, what happens when you knock off glucagon? This is work that Dr. Unger's group did. As late as two, can you imagine somebody's career? Started with glucagon in 1970. His seminal work on glucagon receptor knockout was published in 2015, uh, 2011. Young Lee is the first author, but the corresponding author in this is George Unger. 40 years later. That's a life of a scientist. We, we keep talking about science, this is science. So when glucagon is made inactive, there is something very, very interesting. I'll give you the summary of it. This is normal, this is type 1 diabetes, this is sting. In one sentence, let me give you the summary that Ro Roger Unger, Unger wrote. In the absence of glucagon action, Insulin deficiency is a silent disorder without overt metabolic or clinical manifestations. Not the single manifestation that we know, the fat in the liver, the, uh, the hypertriglyceridemia that occurs along with it, the hyperglycemia that occurs along with it, nothing is present. So now you understand what insulin and glucagon do together, right? There is, no, there, is no, there is no Rama without Lakshmana. So how can you target glucagon? You can inhibit glucagon with glucagon antibodies. You can antagonize glucagon with, uh, with glucagon antagonists. You can, you can work beyond the glucagon receptor by looking at anti-glucagon receptor mRNA. So this is the pancreas, this is the glucagon secreting alpha cell. If you target glucagon, it targets glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Glucagon antagonist will target glucagon. This is a glucagon receptor antagonist. Remember, GLP-1 receptor analogs, we'll come to it in a moment. So how do you look at it? You can have physiological activators of glucagon. This is GIP, GRP, adrenaline, acetylcholine. I'll talk about SGLT2 inhibitors and sulfonylureas. These are pharmacological activators of glucagon. That's why we don't lose as much weight with the SGLT2 inhibitors. The glucagon values go up. I'll talk about it in a moment. Physiological inhibitors of glucagon are insulin, leptin, secretin, somatostatin, GABA, GLP-1. Pharmacological inhibitors are sulfonylureas, DPP-4 inhibitors, and glucagon-like peptide 1. That's why GL the predominant action of GLP-1 RA is at glucagon, right? Now, our favorite drug, DPP-4 inhibitors, are expressed in alpha cells. And when you give them, glucagon comes down, right? That's one of the reasons, and by the way, this is, I believe, TPP4 inhibitors not only not cause hyperglycemia, they protect you from hyperglycemia. 
right? That's because when you give DP4 inhibitors, glucagon comes down. And it's very fascinating, this is work by Bo Aaron et al., and it'll see that when there is DP4 inhibitor in hypoglycemia, it works at the level of GIP, right? When it's hypoglycemia, it works at the level of glucagon. It's, it's very, very interesting stuff. Another drug we don't talk about much is a cardioactive drug called renalazine. It works actually by reducing glucagon. There are some, for, for a while there was an interest in adding renalazine uh, uh, when, when, before the SGLT2 inhibitors, people were talking about renalazine as, as an additive therapy to DP4 inhibitors. SGLT2 inhibitors do the opposite. They, they're explicit in pancreatic alpha cells. They increase the glucagon. And that's really why you would expect the glucose to come down far more We'd expect the weight to come down far more. And one of the reasons that SGLT2 inhibitors are such incomplete agents in this respect is also because of their effect on glucagon. I have a feeling that, that when you use a higher dose of SGLT2 inhibitors, 10 instead of 25, there's a greater glucagon uh, increase. And that's one of the reasons, if you look at the clinical trials, both the EMPA, and it's very interesting to compare the EMPA reg with the uh, verticliflozin study. If you do a subgroup analysis, the lower dose of the SGLT2 inhibitors did much better than the higher dose. In the EMPAREG, the majority of patients were in the lower dose. In the vertigliflozin study, the majority of patients were in the higher dose. See the difference. So one of the reasons to use a lower dose, so, that's, so I use empagliflozin only at 10 milligram doses. And I know that it's probably one of the reasons that dapagliflozin didn't ever come with a second dose. They only came with a 10 milligram dose. It's a submaximal su suppression. It's not a maximum suppression. So this is an article that we wrote. Uh, please look at it. Uh, this is in uh, Journal of Diabetology, but I'll show you something interesting. What are the newer drugs? One, you can, you can, there are newer drugs that, that can be, that can target glucagon. One is the glucagon receptor antagonist, antibodies, antisense nucleotides, Glucagon neutralizing spigamellars, nothing to do with the uh, Zebel getters. And then, of course, uh, those that work at glucagon receptor coagonists, that is uh, GLP-1 coagonists, biagonists, triagonists, and very interestingly, now we have a, a T3 uh, that is working exclusively at the liver, T3 coupled with glucagon. That's probably the future. These are all the glucagon antagonists in clinical trials. I'm going to tell you that none of them is going to make it to the market. I'll tell you why. It's because of this. While there's a benefit in A1C, it causes hyperglycemia, but not as high as expected. It increases glucagon, causes weight gain, increases blood pressure, increases LDL, increases aminotransferases, increases steatosis. But very importantly is the alpha cell hyperplasia. How does it cause it? Remember I said it works with amino acids? It, when you suppress glucagon, the amino acids go to the islet cell. You work at the level of FOXP1 and mTOR pathway. When you activate the mTOR pathway, there is proliferation of the alpha cells. Alpha cell proliferation is a natural response of diabetes, and you're expanding it. I'll talk to you about it in a moment. So glucagon receptor antagonists are probably not going to work. On the other hand, there are drugs that will work at the glucagon receptor at different doses. So most of these polypharmacy drugs, they don't just work in GLP-1R. Is it possible not to talk? It works at the level of the GLP-1 receptor as well as the glucagon receptor. Remember, none of these drugs work only at GLP-1 receptor. They work at the level of the glucagon receptor. So by modulating the action of whether it is working at the glucagon receptor or the GLP-1 receptor, you can get different kinds of molecules. All your drugs that you're getting, terzipatai, rutaturide, all of these are basically modulators of these. So you could have chimeric agents, which means uh, two are not joined together. They're actually condensed. Or you could just additional agents. But each of these have either GLP-1 and Xendin. They have glucagon. They have glucagon or unique or some other molecules. But how has glucagon reinvented itself? It's reinvented itself from, from, from just being a drug to a modified format of it. This is glucagon and T3. So T3 works at brown fat, the liver, and the heart, and, the, and in the bone. When you, it, 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 it causes cardiac arrhythmias, it causes heart rate. But when you combine glucagon with T3, the heart effect is gone. 
right? But we now have a T3 that works specifically on the liver. I'm waiting for its combination with glucagon. That is going to be a blockbuster because it works on brown fat. So the last part is, is what is happening at a molecular level. And let me tell you some interesting stuff. So remember I said that, that in type 1 there is impaired glucagon secretion, that diabetes is not just insulin deficiency, there is an altered glucagon secretion. But what we don't understand, and very interestingly, is that cells, and we didn't know it for many years, an alpha cell and a beta cell are not just that, they are plastic, meaning the alpha cell can com convert to a beta cell, the beta cell can convert to an alpha cell, and all it requires is just change of one, one molecule. In this case, it's ARX, right? So there are multiple transcription factors, but what really happens in diabetes is it's not just the beta cell going away, it's a change in the ratio of the alpha to the beta cell that is causing the problem. That's what we've understood. Now, remember, many of you have heard me talk about what happens to the beta cell in diabetes. When, when the first studies came in, we thought there was beta cell loss, there was beta cell apoptosis. But now we know that the beta cell doesn't lose itself, it changes its identity, right? And I've talked about this many times, including this meeting, about the role of FOXO. When you have hyperglycemia, and we have, when you have lipotoxicity, FOXO is a beacon molecule that remains in the cytoplasm. It patrols the cytoplasm. When you have hyperglycemia, FOXO goes into the nucleus. What does it do? It, it stimulates the MODI genes, HNF2, alpha, all the others, the MODI genes, and continues to preserve the beta cell for a while. But just like any woman who works for her uh, alcoholic husband and says, uh, waits for her, her and then at some point of time goes off and eats, at some point of time, the, the FOXO disappears from the nucleus. When it disappears from the nucleus, a new pathway is created. It, the, either the cell undergoes apoptosis if things are very, very bad, or it moves to a less demanding cellular em environment. A less demanding cellular environment is where it doesn't make insulin. After the heart, the beta cell has the most amount of mitochondria. If it continues to be in a high demanding environment, the cell has to die. So one of the ways the, the beta cell protects itself is saying, I no longer am going to make insulin. It can lose its endocrine function. It can start making uh, ghrelin, but or more likely, it becomes an alpha cell. That's one of the reasons you have alpha cell hyperplasia and diabetes. A significant amount of cells convert from beta cells to alpha cells. And interestingly, I put B to A to A to B, nothing to do with the uh, either, either business or, or to the uh, uh, bad uh, restaurant chain. It has got everything to do with what can be done. Beta cell can be converted to alpha cells. Alpha cells can also be converted to beta cells. All it requires is inactivation of one protein, and that's ARX, right? And can that be done? And the answer is, we have data. Now, there are a group of drugs called the artemisins. People who practice infectious disease will understand these drugs, right? They work through the GABA receptor of the alpha cells and can convert the alpha cell into the beta cell. This is still experimental. It's going to take a while. But this is the future. One of the ways that we can take care of diabetes is to convert alpha cells to beta cells. So the, beta cell, the alpha cell is not, not a tavil or a, or, 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 or a jalatarangam in, in a concert. It's like Ranjani and Gayatri. It's a superb, well-modulated, fabulous singers compensating. I don't know how many of you have listened to Ranjani Gayatri music. When one goes up, the other comes down. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's pure symphony, exactly. And if, if, if one of them develops a cold or a cough, the whole concert is gone. That's exactly what happens right in the pancreas. So we haven't understood the alpha cell because of many reasons. 
we 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 got carried away by insulin resistance we carried got carried away by the beta cell i think it's the whole of it the the relationship between the alpha cell and the beta cell is what causes diabetes what prevents diabetes and one day will treat diabetes thank you so much